Hello, I'm David Atkins, uh, Principal Solution Architect at Progress. And today I'm going to talk about application evolution and specifically evolving your core application. So a light-hearted view of the impact of uh, not having a great architecture. The, this is the ultimate example of a uh, bad user experience. You could have a great looking facade and <laughs> behind it there's absolutely nothing. Now I'm not suggesting this is the case for your application of course, uh, but it does highlight the importance of having a robust backend. And I'm sure we've all uh, experienced this to some degree where you've downloaded an application, maybe a mobile app on your phone, with great expectations on paper it should have been just what you needed but you found it was lacking in, uh, the, the experience was lacking. Perhaps the performance of the app was terrible or it didn't offer the security uh, of your data that you needed, things like that, that would be enabled by the back end. Uh, and our, our goal at Progress is just to make sure that you never get into the situation where your application is providing that kind of substandard experience to your users. So I think we're all familiar with this uh, Open Edge reference architecture view. Uh, this has been shown on uh, you know, various presentations and conferences for many years in, in one flavor or another. The primary goal of this was just to talk about separation of business logic from UI. And, and that is still very applicable, very true today. But these days, we're also talking about things like evolving applications from monolithic architectures into componentized, modularized microservice architectures. So perhaps we want to evolve that OERA, Open Edge Reference Architecture, more towards something like what you see on the screen now. This is certainly slightly more reflecting uh, modern best practices, but it's still uh, somewhat simplistic. Making that move from the monolithic architecture to microservices um, you know, has a broader impact than you might expect. You probably already made, or in the process of making that move to Entia, and then when you get to Entia and expose REST APIs, uh, you can then start to uh, group those into the appropriate microservices um, to enable this modular component-based architecture. And that's not just beneficial from um, application maintenance development perspective, but it lays the groundwork for you being able to deploy those lightweight, typically stateless microservices in containers. Uh, you may have already made the move from physical service to virtual service. Deploying to containers is a natural next step. Uh, it has efficiencies of getting more out of your physical machines, uh, but typically it is beneficial because you can just spin up containers very, very quickly. And one of the reasons uh, they're used in that way, or, or one way they're used benefiting from that speed of deployment, is in modern DevOps. Uh, containers, particular Docker and uh, orchestrated Docker containers with technologies like Kubernetes, uh, are typically used in DevOps to, to spin up test targets during test automation. Um, so if you're in that process of evolving your development practices from waterfall to agile, uh, integrating uh, test automation, CICD, uh, is, is the logical next step. And containerization should probably be a part of your plans in that area. And evolving to a microservices architecture will help you in that process. But containers can also be useful in your production deployment environment as well. Um, not least because they make it much easier to do things like elastic scalability where you need to spin up and spin down additional uh, app server instances to get scalability to, in response to load instead of having to over provision for worst case scenarios up front. Uh, and that's going to become more and more important particularly as you uh, deploy into the cloud or just when you're deploying your application to support a more variable cloud client type. So if you're having web and mobile clients, they're available 24 by 7. It's harder to predict exactly what the load is going to be. That's when in using things like containers for elastic scalability in your deployment environment could be really beneficial. So you can see that uh, the, the OERA is a somewhat simplistic view, even when you factor in microservices. So our, our new reference architecture, if you will, for uh, cloud deployment really encompasses more than just the application architecture, the, the tiered separation, which is kind of shown on the right here, but encompasses all of the other aspects that you need for a modern cloud deployment. And we don't necessarily mean by that uh, deploying into a cloud infrastructure. It's really a cloud-ready architecture, meaning uh, you could be deploying this on-premise, but uh, it is ready to support uh, cloud clients. Uh, you're not only providing a browser-based interface for internal clients within a secure network, but you're basically having clients across the public internet. And there's a lot going on in this slide, so we're going to talk through this step by step. 
First of all, the application architecture. This is essentially what was represented in the, the tiered uh, traditional Open Edge reference architecture slide. And you can see you have the database, you have your application server tier, which is uh, shown clustered here in this example, and that is serving up different interfaces for clients to consume. Perhaps the most relevant uh, these days is REST, but obviously we still need to support um, native ABL clients, SOAP clients, uh, other types of clients as well, and we, and we certainly still do that. Now the two enabling, key enabling technologies here are the, the uh, Progress App Server for Open Edge as the app server tier, and the, the APIs in particular REST. So we're going to talk a little bit more now about um, PaaS for Open Edge and uh, the various REST API options you have. So we're not going to go into a ton of technical detail about PaaS for Open Edge and what it is, but I uh, wanted to highlight some of the reasons why you should move to it and, and why you should adopt PaaS for Open Edge uh, in your evolving architecture. There's many reasons. Uh, one of the most important is security. PaaS for Open Edge provides a Spring security framework, which is very standards-based. Uh, it's very open. Uh, it's extensible, and it, it gives you a lot of flexibility in how you want to authenticate users, how you want to configure authorization of access to your backend. And one of the great things about the Spring security framework in PaaS for Open Edge is that the Spring security configuration applies across all protocols. Another key thing is scalability. Uh, one of the, the big differences, if you've used the, uh, the classic Open Edge app server, one of the big differences with PaaS for Open Edge is that its agent is a multi-session agent. So instead of having one operating system agent process for each client connection, as you did with the classic app server, with the PaaS for Open Edge, a single multi-session agent can handle literally hundreds and hundreds of client connections. That also provides a simplified architecture. Not only do you have less of those agent processes, but you no longer have a dependency on like an admin server process. If you want to do things like um, uh, load balancing, then it doesn't require proprietary components like the name server load balancer. It just, because it's very standards based, just requires a standard HTTP load balancer in front of it. And a single agent not only can support multiple connections, it can support multiple connections using different state models. So uh, very, very s m much simpler architecture. We've also extended the uh, administration options as a command line interface, as a REST API. You can continue to use Open Edge Management, Open Edge Explorer. Uh, and there's a JMX instrumentation, because Pass for Open Edge is based upon Tomcat, which has a JMX uh, interface, which we've extended with all of the Open Edge specific uh, instrumentation. And that allows you to use JMX tools like JConsole, and we ship some command line JMX utilities as well. Another benefit of Pass for Open Edge is our recommended best practice uh, approaches for implementing REST service interfaces uh, using the new web handler transport that Pass for Open Edge uh, supports and exposes. And we'll talk more about that on the next slide. Um, another thing is that Pass for Open Edge, we already, with the Open Edge 11.7.4 release, we support deploying Pass for Open Edge to Docker containers. And as we've already mentioned, there's many benefits to moving in that direction for uh, pre-production and production use of uh, containers for the app server tier. Uh, and maybe last but not least, uh, Pass for Open Edge is the go forward app server for Open Edge. All future investment in the app server is going to be on Pass for Open Edge. So there's a ton of reasons why you should um, move to PassOE if you haven't already uh, started down that path. Now, one of those, the, the REST service interface options, I'm going to dive into a little bit more now. Before we dive into that, let's just think about what a REST service interface does. It really just converts from the REST domain to the ABL domain. So it takes a uh, HTTP REST request coming in, like a, a GET request if you're receiving data, a POST request if you are creating new records or new data on the back end, and it maps that to a call on the appropriate procedure or class operation, and it maps the data from the incoming request to parameters on those uh, procedures or class operations. That data may be coming from the body of that REST request, it may come from query string parameters, from custom headers, things like that. And then it does the same on the back end. After when you get the response from the ABL resource that you've uh, called, it maps that into the HTTP response back to that REST client. 
Now we have really three recommended best practice approaches to this, uh, and they're applicable in different scenarios. The way I've um, categorized them here is really in terms of productivity and, and effort uh, involved in, in using these different approaches. Now, the first approach is what we call a no-code or low-code approach for creating a prescriptive REST API. If you don't need a lot of control over exactly how the REST API, the external API, is structured, so you're happy to have a, a prescribed URL schema, and you're happy to support very um, prescriptive, uh, specific query string parameters, then that prescriptive REST API is the most productive way to expose either database tables directly or your existing procedures, uh, object op uh, class operations. Because by and large, it's driven by tooling within Progress Developer Studio to create the assets, the ABL services, the business entities that underpin this. So that, that's the most productive approach, but you have less control over the structure of that REST API. If you want to have more control and you need to create what we're calling a custom REST API, meaning you define the URL schema, you define what specific query string parameters your REST API is going to support, and which custom headers it's going to support, then the final two approaches here are the ones you would choose. And really the difference here, they're both using the same underlying technology, which is the new web handler that was introduced when uh, Pass Rogue was introduced. But there's two approaches to using Web Handler. You can create your own ABL Web Handler, coding the ABL yourself, in which case you basically get the entire REST request and you just pull it apart using ABL code. Not particularly complex code, but you can have as much flexibility as you want to, um, to route that uh, in as fine fine-grained detail way that you want to. However, if you don't want to dedicate ABL resources to coding this REST service interface logic, the mapping essentially. A another approach is to use a pre-built web handler called the data object handler, which will read the mapping from the REST domain to the ABL domain from a JSON mapping file. It's a JSON mapping file that follows a very well-defined schema, and it gives you almost as much, very, very nearly as much flexibility as, as hand coding the ABL web handler yourself, but you don't have to have an ABL expert doing it. You can have someone who can just understand the interface to the back-end logic that needs to be called, understand the REST API that's desired on the front-end, and can just craft that mapping in a JSON file instead. So going back to consider the other aspects of that uh, new reference architecture for cloud deployment, another uh, important aspect when you start to support clients that are coming in over the public internet is you need to, to worry about the boundaries between your secure internal area, internal network and the outside world. So at the very least, you're going to want to introduce some kind of an API gateway or a router uh, in the DMZ that is going to become the single entry point to your, um, to your internal infrastructure from the outside world. And it'll potentially be going then through a load balancer, which will spread the load across a clustered app server tier on the back end. You may also need to start integrating with some external systems from your internal systems using REST APIs, because this, uh, this degree of separation across the internet is often going to mean you don't have direct SQL access or direct secure access, and you need to start consuming external data via REST APIs. So that's an another consideration. You also want to try and uh, externalize the, the security, the authentication, outside of your, your secure backend, your, your private network. You want to not only route, sort of route the requests through an API gateway, but you want to authenticate the users uh, that are sending requests through that gateway before they get into your private network. And we have some various technology to do that. Uh, we have the authentication gateway. Um, that and Spring Security on Pazzo, we can use external identity providers. Another consideration when evolving to a more cloud-friendly architecture or shifting to a cloud deployment model is the impact that may have on data integration. In particular, the challenges of hybrid cloud to on-prem integration, the need to potentially expose standardized REST-based access to your data, and the fact that you might want to expose an analytics-friendly interface to your data that still uses data access logic, not direct to the database. Just talking through those one by one, hybrid cloud to on-prem data integration, if you are moving, say, your ERP system from an on-prem 
uh, deployment model to the cloud, yet you still need to integrate with an on-premise SQL Server-based warehouse management system, uh, then you, you're introducing cloud to on-prem sort of hybrid integration need. Or if you um, are doing a, a partial migration to cloud infrastructure and you have a cloud deployed head office application that needs access to on-premise data in remote factories or stores. In both cases, you need this uh, cloud to on-prem integration. Uh, Progress hybrid data pipeline can enable that without a lot of complex security configurations like VPN tunnels and um, IP whitelisting and those sorts of things without having to expose, uh, open up ports in the firewalls of those on-prem scenarios. Uh, in terms of exposing standardized REST-based access to your data, increasingly as, as you and your customers adopt more cloud-based services like Salesforce, uh, Dynamics, Oracle Financials, cloud-hosted applications, there'll be more and more demand to integrate data from your open edge applications into those cloud services. And one option there is to replicate your data into those, but then you end up paying for storage, so it can be costly, and you're also serving up stale, out-of-date data uh, through those interfaces. It's better to do real-time integration from your back end into those cloud services. Now, increasingly, to do that, those cloud services assume that you are exposing a standardized uh, flavor of REST API called OData to your back end. Uh, fortunately, um, hybrid data pipeline, again, can help with this particular issue. Uh, and if you pair it with another product we have called the Autonomous REST Connector, uh, Hybrid Data Pipeline can do that either direct to the database, the OpenEdge database, or it can access the data and serve it up through this OData API um, through a data access logic layer, ABL data access logic. Which brings us to that third scenario, which is from an analytics perspective, uh, as you move to the cloud, particularly if you are adopting uh, multi-tenancy, you probably want to uh, only expose access to your data through a data access layer, uh, REST API. Uh, and that, that can have challenges in terms of how your customers or you are going to be doing reporting and analytics against your data. Uh, th this is increasingly um, more and more of a demand because it's always been a best practice to access data through data access layer, but as multi-tenancy and now greater security compliance with GDPR and other standards like that, it's becoming more and more um, beneficial to only permit data access through that layer. Um, and Progress's autonomous REST connector is one way that you can expose a SQL API, a SQL view of your REST API. It essentially turns a SQL query into a request on your REST API and vice versa on the response, uh, which means you and your customers can continue to consume data using the tools that you traditionally would for reporting, maybe Tableau or something like that, as though you're talking to a database and the autonomous REST connector will actually uh, be consuming the data through a REST API, which means your business logic will be doing whatever it does. Uh, additional security, masking of data, uh, really detailed things like that. So I urge you to take a look at Hybrid Data Pipeline and Autonomous REST Connector to address the new data integration challenges that may arise from evolving your application to the cloud. And of course, user interface and user experience remain a key driver for application evolution. And Progress certainly has great tools and technologies like NativeScript, Kendo UI, and Native Chat for creating user interfaces for the web, for mobile, and even conversational uh, chatbots, chat UIs. Uh, now, these front-end technologies, they can certainly be integrated directly against REST APIs exposed by Paths for Open Edge or other systems. But in some situations, particularly for mobile clients and particularly when there are multiple backends that those user interfaces need to integrate with, it can be adv advantageous to introduce a mediation tier between the UI and those backends. Uh, and, in, and in Progress, we have Progress Kinvey that can act as that mediation tier, as a backend as a service for web and mobile uh, clients. Uh, and Kinvey can orchestrate data and security across diverse backends, uh, including the core Open Edge application. It can transform and contextualize data for those mobile web clients, uh, you know, perhaps uh, using a device location from a mobile client to sort data, something like that. Uh, it also can add uh, support for things like uh, disconnected use for a mobile app, offline storage, uh, connection management, resyncing with the back end, uh, and things like engagement services, push notifications, text messages. But perhaps one of the biggest values is it, it just acts as a, a decoupling tier. So the, the web and mobile front ends, they're decoupled from the back end, which means that that Kinvey mediation layer uh, is all 
the UI needs to worry about. It doesn't have to worry about changes in the back end if it moves location, if the API changes slightly. That is taken care of by the mediation layer. Uh, so that, that decoupling uh, means that the mobile and web development can, can proceed in parallel with development on the back end, with the mediation tier taking care of uh, integration to the back end. Uh, essentially two-speed IT. The mediation tier can, they can mock those back ends, which really means the UI developer can focus on UI development, which is what they should be focused on. You shouldn't need the UI developers, be it web or mobile, to have any more knowledge than absolutely necessary about the back end, not need to worry about the diverse security and schemas and APIs on the back end, but have the simplest possible um, interface to code against. And Kinvey can provide that through a clear, consistent API. And Kinvey also provides client-side SDKs for various mobile frameworks for web development, which makes it even simpler to interact and interface with Kinvey. So it's, uh, it's a great technology if you're looking at how to maximize productivity of your UI developers. Uh, essentially, in that scenario, Kinvey can act as that API gateway and router layer in the, in the DMZ. So just a couple of validation points. Infor is uh, one of our largest open edge partners, and, and they've been going down this path of application evolution, moving to a cloud architecture for several years now. And, and this quote from Eric Ryerson just validates that they believe open edge has evolved to allow them to continue to innovate. And uh, you know, validating that, that open edge is, uh, is a great platform for innovating towards modern best practice architectures. And a few data points on the timeline of how Infor have gone about doing that um, application evolution. They started four or five years ago with a large monolithic GUI application, uh, a large ERP for the distribution um, business. And they spent three years separating the, their business logic from the UI. And this, this is, this is the, the painful step that often holds people up. In, in Infor's um, case, having gone through that um, that that step of separating business logic from UI, they were then very quickly able to put that REST service interface layer in front of that separated business logic. And then in just one year, they, they rewrote their entire UI using modern web development best practices. And the net result of that is that the Cloud Suite distribution ERP is now an internal reference within Infor for product architecture best practices. In this snapshot, you may see some similarities between this and the, the earlier cloud reference architecture, particularly in terms of having uh, elastic load balancing in front of an app server tier, which is clustered for horizontal scalability. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the web server tier, I believe, is actually going to be, uh, PazOE is going to be taking over the web server role in their architecture as well. So I believe the IIS web server tier is going to be um, leaving this architecture in the future. So th this is a, a great example of people using the types of architectural best practices that, that we recommend. So hopefully that gives you a, a good sense of you know, the importance of architecture, where progress is recommending uh, you, you evolve toward uh, the recommended best practices, the, the tools and technologies that, that we can provide to help with that. We can also provide you some assistance in actually getting there. Um, we have professional services with a lot of experience of modernizing, evolving our customers and partners' uh, open edge applications. And we recognize that, that that is not a very easy thing to define because there's many different starting points. And everyone has their own priorities uh, about where they want to get to, which aspect of it they want to modernize first. Uh, and we can help in many different ways, but we have a proven methodology to, to go about these projects. The first stages of which are always deep analysis of where you're at today discussion with you about where you want to go, and then we can help you with that gap analysis and the planning process of, of how to get from where you are today to where you need to be. Uh, a couple of focus areas where we've done multiple projects is things like uh, e-commerce solutions, building out mobility solutions, uh, self-service web portals, uh, business intelligence, things like that, but that's certainly not the, the full extent of our professional services areas. But first and foremost, we, we've done this many times before for customers and partners in many different situations with different starting point technologies, uh, and it's been a proven successful approach and methodology. So uh, please, please reach out if you'd like help with evolving your application.
And in terms of next steps, hopefully one of the takeaways from this is that, that application ev evolution, uh, not only is, it, is architecture you know, central to that, but application evolution itself needs to be uh, an ongoing and necessary investment. You can't just stand still because your competitors aren't going to. And the technology landscape's constantly changing, so the expectations are changing. Evolution uh, of your application is, is something that needs constant ongoing investment. And I think now more than ever, with the, the pace of technology change and disruptive startups, startups uh, entering very many verticals, evolving and modernizing applications is more important than it's ever been. If you feel you've underinvested in this in the last few years, then you, you can't really afford not to invest in it now. It's becoming an imperative. And progress tools and technologies you know, have certainly evolved to help you evolve. In particular, Paths for Open Edge and the enhancements in Open Edge v12 uh, are really going to help you with that application evolution process. So uh, I'd encourage you to, to reach out to your account manager or your, uh, your sales engineer, uh, and certainly check out some of the new features in Open Edge 12 following the link that's on the slide here right now. Thank you very much.